I've always been a fan of, of Giamatti as an actor, you know, both as a lead and obviously as a character actor. We all discovered, you know, Giamatti in our own way. For, for some, it was sideways. You know, for others, it might have been the miniseries John Adams, which was very good. You know, maybe you first saw him in Big Fat Liar, another classic chat. For me, humble beginnings chat. For me, it was Big Mama's house as Agent John. I knew this guy was going places after that film. Boy, you ain't right. Did somebody hook you up to a jumper cable or something other? When I say I got to go move, I got to go. Wait, wait. Yeah. Uh -oh. We're going to go ahead and we're going to move on to the next part of my show today. And that is my review for Alexander Payne's latest film, The Holdovers. And for those that need a bit of background, a bit of a synopsis for the movie, set in 1970s New England, a curmudgeonly and bitter history teacher at a Catholic boarding school is forced to chaperone a handful of students with nowhere to go for Christmas break. Now, this film is from director Alexander uh, Payne, who has you know, often been known for his contemporary satires of, of, of American society, including Election, about Schmidt, uh, Sideways, which also starred Paul Giamatti, and of course, The, the Descendants, and he's done other movies as well. You know, this, this is his first film, I believe in like five or six years after Downsizing, uh, which I, I personally consider uh, that to be his, his, his weakest directorial effort. I think that is his weakest film that, that, that I've seen. You know, I was, I was asked uh, not too long ago uh, here about, you know, what my favorite Christmas movie was. You know, several, you know, traditional movies like A Christmas Story, Christmas Vacation and It's a Wonderful Life, you know, come to mind for me, I think for a lot of people. And and more like, you know, alt Christmas films if if you will, like, you know, like Gremlins and 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 Krumpus and and of course, you know, Die Hard are are some of my favorites too. And even more recent movies like, you know, Klaus are now essential viewing for me uh every year now at this point. Well, after watching The Holdovers, I can safely say that Payne's latest film is going to be one of those modern classics that I will be watching for many Christmases to come because this film is absolutely fantastic. I have to say, you know, before touching on, on the characters and, and the stories itself, um, but so much of this movie <laughs> reminded me of, of my childhood at a boys all Catholic private school. F from the aesthetic of the school itself to the, to the snowy setting and the many wholesome and bitter personalities, it, it reminded me so much of my own high school career. I, I knew so many of the types of students and, and teachers in this movie, both both good and bad. And I have to say, I just, I just had this rush of, of, of memories while watching this, this film. It's very nostalgic and warm many times, but also kind of shows a cruel and, and lonely side in that niche environment that I'm familiar with that is just so obviously nakedly true. And I was just like, wow, they are nailing this. Despite being a period piece, despite taking place, you know, in 1970, 1971, it was like, yep, I, I, I experienced a lot of the same stuff. The, the, I knew a lot of these same people, just the environment, the personalities, people rubbed each other the right way or the wrong way. I was just like, wow, I, yeah, I know. It, it, it has a lot in common. I'll tell you right now, chap, in the future, this, this movie, The Holdovers, is, is going to be a companion piece to another film that I love, which is Dead Poet Society, which stars, uh, which starred Robin Williams and a very young, very baby-faced Ethan Hawke and a number of other recognizable actors of, of, of the time. A fantastic movie. These movies have so much in common. They nail so many of the aesthetics of that kind of, you know, all-Catholic 
you know, private school in that in that setting. It's just like they they, they got it right. <laughs> they did they did their research, chat. I was incredibly impressed because I I would know is that was that a lot of this was my experience growing up in in Buffalo, New York, going to I mean, my high school was St. Francis of Assisi, uh, St. Francis uh, High School. And I'm like, yeah, just, just the look of the classrooms, kind of the older stuff. It was like, oh, this prestigious high school. And, you know, it's a, it's a great um, uh, point to uh, uh, build up for your college career and everything. And, you know, um, not only just, you know, through, through your, your work and grades, but, you know, through the extracurricular activities and sports and stuff. It was like, yeah, all of this. I, I know all of this. It just feels... He was like, I, I, I went to the school, uh, even, even despite its, its, you know, time period of the 1970s, um, before even getting to like the main actors, you know, the movie is, is, is wonderfully written by David Hemmingson, who I'm not too familiar with as a screenwriter, but he does a fantastic job. The, the dialogue is, is wickedly smart, uh, funny, uh, cutting, and can also be very inspirational at times. We see so many sides of, of the main characters. The, the trio that is Paul Giamatti, uh, Dominic uh, Sessa, I hope I'm saying his name correctly, Dominic uh, or Sessa, probably Dominic Sessa, and Divine Joy Randolph, who play uh, Mr. Paul Hunnam, uh, Angus Tully, and, and Mary Lamb, respectively. You know, the, the movie mostly focuses on them, though we are introduced to a much larger a group earlier, uh, specifically... Uh, the, the boys who are initially uh, left left behind. And though they only have like a third of the screen time that the main trio have, they all felt perfectly mismatched with, with each other and acted like several people that I even knew growing up, you know, in high school, while going to high school in, in Buffalo, uh, New York. You have like the, 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 the kids that are like sent to the school, even though it's very much a Catholic, you know, private boarding school, but they are not Catholic. You know, we have a Mormon kid. We have one a kid who's from... Uh, uh, from Asia, from from Korea, uh, in the film, and they feel really awkward in this environment. You have just the obnoxious kind of like sociopathic uh, kids that are going there, who like everything was done for them and paid for them in their lives, and they're only there because of the money, even though they're just horrible. You have like the smart. Uh, but at the same time, like trouble kid who's going through like an enormous you know, rough patch in, in his in his life. And he just wants to be away from this place. But he shows promise. It's like, wow, they do like a, just a really good job of even though they're some some of these kids are only there for like a third of the film. It's like, yeah, their their performances all ring true. It's all very earnest and and odd uh, and honest. But as I was saying before, but really, it, it is the main three. It's the main uh, three leads that I, I want to focus on. And of course, you know, I want to start first with, with Paul Giamatti as, as Mr. Uh, Hunnam. Now, I've always been a fan of, of Giamatti as an actor, you know, both as a lead and obviously as a character actor. We all discovered, you know, Giamatti in our own way. For, for some, it was sideways. You know, for others, it might have been the miniseries John Adams, which was very good. You know, maybe you first saw him in Big Fat Liar, another classic chat. For me, humble beginnings chat. For me, it was Big Mama's house as Agent John. I knew this guy was going places after that film. Boy, you ain't right. Did somebody hook you up to a jumper cable or something other? When I say I got to go move, I got to go. Wait, wait. Yeah. Uh -oh. Hell. Who can forget his performance as the Rhino? <laughs> I am the Rhino! I mean, we all knew it. From Big Fat Liar chat to Big Mama's house. And then, of course, yes, chat. Mm -hmm. Maze of Spider-Man 2. But listen. It, <laughs> I'm the Rhino! But in all seriousness, uh, he delivers a career best performance in this movie as, 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 as Mr. Hunnam. Man, it's it's such a it's such a rich character because we when we first see him before we first see him we get a sense of who this guy is like the opening credits of the movie where it, it first starts like we're with this chorus and this chorus teacher is like you know helping prep these kids for the end of the year uh, uh, performances and then you know as the choir is you know singing we then cut to all these different parts of the school we get a sense of the environment and, and the season the town that that that, it, that that you know that the that the school occupies um, but then we cut to like 
the uh, the apartment, the on campus apartment of of Paul Giamatti's character, and it's just you know they just nail the '70s aesthetic. We like start in his bathroom, and we just see all the soap scum everywhere. Like this guy's been living here for like probably decades. I mean, really, we find out it has been decades. We see his athlete foot powder. We see his preparation H on the uh, on the sink and stuff. We go inside to his like den area, his office. Um, combination living room, and it's like I remember, like hell, when I was working at Texas State, like yep, I, I these were some people's the way people's offices. They were almost like a second home here. And very, in this case, it was very much his home. Whereas like all these old books everywhere. He's smoking on a pipe. He's grading papers. He's talking shit while grading these papers. These Philistines. These children are Philistines. You know they're terrible. They're a bunch of dum dums. And I was like, we're getting just a, already a, a look into like who this guy is. You know, even before we first meet him, even before we even first hear him. And um, this, this, is the, this is a character that any actor, I think, would just love to sink their teeth into. Because one, first of all, I have to say, like, Paul Giamatti's character uh, definitely have a mis- uh, of Mr. Hunnam. His character definitely has a very distinct look. Because if you see the trailers, it's like, wow, this guy is wall-dyed. And I had no idea. I was like, was Paul Giamatti always been like this wall-dyed in his career? Did it just get worse? I'm like, wow, I had no idea. But no, they that is a thing that they have in the movie, him being wall-dyed. And uh, it's it's brought up in the film in like different ways. Like he 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 even, he's aware of it. He makes note of it. And he kind of, you know, uh, uh, um, talks about it in, in, in such a way that in order to pre- almost kind of shield himself from people like mocking him the way he looks, he's like, well, even my disability, I can do this and that and everything. So he's like very much a- aware of it, you know, for it's defined so much of, uh, of, his, of his life. But then there's also another thing uh, brought up about like his body odor and how like that's made him like really sheltered and not want to like engage in social situations and it's because of like a medical issue he has, and it's just like, oh, and you, you you begin to understand like why this this history teacher is so angry and bitter at the world and has such resentment towards the students because throughout his whole life he had this thing, he had this you know this thing was body odor, and that of course made it hard for him to be in social interactions. And when that's like revealed throughout the course of the movie, it's just like, oh shit, you 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 do feel sorry for him. You begin to understand him. You you judge him. Like you judge all these characters at first because of this and that, you know, or whatever. But then you really get to the heart of the matter. It's just like, ah oh, damn. You know, it's it's sad. Like his we 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 find out about his insecurities, his alcoholism in the film and and his past. And it's very, very fascinating. And a lot of this is uh, brought up through his interactions with the two other leads in the movie and the other person being Dominic Sessa who plays uh, the character of Angus. What's so, and apparently Shat, uh, first of all, he's fantastic in the movie. I'm like, have I seen this kid before? Like where, what else has this, has this actor been in? This is his first film ever. Now he has acted before. He's, he's done acting on the stage uh, in the theater, but this is his first movie. And wow, incredibly uh, impressed. He looks like uh, he could like walk out of um, uh, an episode of Stranger Things, like just his look. Because they, they really na- nailed the, like, the time period and everything. Even though I know Stranger Things set in the 80s is set in the 70s, but it feels like, oh, he could be almost gonna, one of the other kids in like a Stranger Things or something, one of the older ones. But he's great. He plays this kid who is incredibly intelligent. Uh, but he's very sassy. He's very sarcastic. He constantly gets into fights with the uh, faculty, but also the other kids in it. You know, um, he has this like super quick wit and is able to kind of figure a person out and then like deconstruct him. But he has his also his own like you know insecurities. He has this bad attitude. He has this chip on his shoulder. We learn more about uh, why he has that throughout the film. It's like at first it's like oh it, that's what's so great with the movie. It's like at first we think it's this. And then it's actually like there's something else. And then there's like a bigger reveal. It's like, oh, man, it gets more complicated. Like the movie almost, it tricks you at times like, oh, is this how it's going to, you can kind of figure out like, is this going to get like a little too cheesy, a little too corny because this is the, this is going to be the reveal. And it's not. It's actually most times like even a little darker than we would have thought. And I really like that. It, it surprised me occasionally. And when those moments happen, when they're revealed, it's, it's complemented by fantastic dialogue and wonderful acting by the rest of the actors. But the, Dominic Sessa, I, mean, I hope I'm saying his name correctly, 
he is great. Uh, he definitely deserves some award attention uh, as, 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 as well. Uh, love what they, they did with him. And he has just so many funny scenes. Like, he is very... I mean, the thing is, you know, Paul Giamatti is an incredibly charismatic actor. It's like, yeah, he can play the weird uh, character, tertiary, secondary character in the film, but he can also very much be like, I am the center of attention now in this scene. It's all eyes on me. Like, he's so charismatic. And to see him having, like, other actors um bounce off of him or is also equally as charismatic is like really exciting because so much of the movie is just around these three people and their weird relationship but then moving on from a uh, dominic sessa's angus we also have a uh, divine joy randolph as 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 mary lamb and she has some of the best moments in the film she has she gets some of the best monologues in the movie when we find out more about her but she's the head chef of the um boarding school and she suffered a recent loss in her life. Her son, um, who was also a student at the school, eventually joined the, the military because he wanted to be able to pay for college since they didn't have the money to do so. And uh, he ends up dying in Vietnam. And so it's so much of the movie is her dealing with her grief during this time of the year and slowly revealing it to other, other people. And she has like a number, she's like three moments in the movie that like really stand out uh, to me. I don't know if I've ever seen her or anything else, but very impressed. Like her, she has a, at first it starts out as this very kind of friendly uh, conversation between her and Paul Giamatti, which is also funny because Paul Giamatti's despised by the students. He's despised by most of the staff and faculty, but he has this like good relationship with her and she kind of understands him and, and he understands her. And so it's like, they're kind of like these two people you would never figure would interact with each other, but they do. It's very interesting. Like you instantly get that too. Um, but they, there's like a great moment where it's like the first, you know, however many couple of days that they're like over uh, uh, at the school when everyone has left. And we learn more about her past and the circumstances uh, and, and, and her son and how she raised him and why she has the job here. Great. There is a, and I don't want to reveal too much. She has a, a wonderful scene and there's a, they go to a party at one point in the movie and she reveals just how horrible she's feeling about the passing of her son. I'll say it's the, it's the ki kitchen scene. Yep, GC's right. The kitchen scene with her is great. And it's even done with like very little. I mean, what she says is so powerful, but even just her body language in that scene, I was very impressed by it. Um, and then later on, like her, 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 her interactions with, with Paul Giamatti and their, and their back and forth and, and Angus are, 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 are great. You know, it's, um, it's like the, the, the movie, the movie is like, cause all these people are upset. Like their Christmas is, is not how it used to be. Right. They're all like, I used to do it this way. I used to do it that way. Or I used to just do this alone. I used to vacation and it's, you know, whether it was with their families or not or by themselves. And I think so much, like there's so much like emphasis placed on like the family going to visit your, your, your family every year or whatever. But sometimes throughout your life, you might not have that familiar connection with blood relatives sometimes your family is the family you find along the way sometimes is the, uh, your family is you know people you or ordinarily wouldn't think uh, you would be on friendly terms with but the more you you talk to each other and explore with each other you you come to like wow have a lot of respect and and create a friendship or create a love and that's what these three people with three very distinct backgrounds do for each other and they find out that they actually have a lot more in common and then they ever would have uh, had had they not spoken to each other, and I like really like that in the movie. It's about the the family that you find around around this time of year that can be like super unex, unexpected, uh, and that's what, that's just very interesting uh, to me because this is like this is a Christmas movie. This is just a very uh, warm and and passionate Christmas film. Um, but it also has these scenes where it shows kind of cruelty and, and, and bitterness, like how that could be brought out in the time of the year. But at the same time, we can, we can, we can better our, ourselves through our connections with all sorts of different people. But what's been so funny is that apparently Alexander Payne, he doesn't understand why people are now calling this like this is going to be a new Christmas classic. He, I, th I think he's like said, I've become nauseated at the fact that I made a, made a wholesome Christmas movie. But I think that's exactly what I thought you intended to make. You know, um, I mean, I guess when it comes to movie making, 
you know, there's the movie that you 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 write first. You, it starts as a screenplay. You think it's this one thing, and then you shoot the movie. And then it's kind of maybe that what you n initially envisioned that changes, and then it's a whole other movie and experience. For people that like actually see and interpret it, interpret it. But it's like so much of this movie just felt like, well, this this is a, this is going to be a this is his Christmas movie, you know. And for having come out, it's like, I didn't make like a wholesome, warm Christmas. Well, that's exactly what you did. <laughs> Absolutely. So it's kind of it's kind of insane that he's he's been a little turned off by the, the 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 praise. He didn't expect the praise to to take this form uh, of it now going to probably most likely be a beloved Christmas film. But it is. I I really really enjoy this movie. And in the end. You know, this this is not only, I think, one of the best movies of the year, but it's probably going to be one of the best Christmas movies of the 2020s. This is going to be kind of like a now a yearly tradition. It's like, let's put on the holdovers, you know? And this is, this is I could see them may, uh, playing this movie at St. Francis High School, you know, and be like, hey, this is kind of similar to some of the experiences that, that we've had, whether, whether you're teaching there or whether you're, you know, a student there. It, that's what it just felt like to me. Um, so, yeah, I... Uh, I really enjoyed this movie, Chad. I, I recommend seeing it. It is currently in theaters uh, right now. I don't know if it's limited release or a huge theatrical release. It is available on on uh, to, to rent, I believe. Uh, so you could watch it that way. There are probably some other options you can look into to, to see the film, but... I uh, I highly uh, recommend it, Chad. This is uh, this is one of my favorite movies of the year, and um, yeah, it's probably going to be on my top ten list. I don't know I don't know exactly uh, uh, know where, but for right now, it's pretty high on that list, and it's 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 a movie I think a lot of people are are going to enjoy. But what about you guys? Uh, have you even did how many of you guys have even heard of the holdovers? until today um are you interested in seeing the film for those who have seen the film uh what did you think did you like it as much as me were you maybe turned off by some aspects of it please let me know and uh i can't wait uh for you guys to talk about how you felt about the movie